And Saussure was one of the first to bring up the problem that languages, different languages, cut up the world in different ways. So that's a sheep, and that is, what is that called, please? Mutton. Mutton, lovely, thank you. In French, though, they're both called mouton. Uh, the animal and the meat have the same name. In English, one's a sheep and the other is mutton. So the different languages cut up semantic space in different ways. And we know this happens. Saussure repeats this a lot. And this is why we have different language systems. Now, if that happens systematically, you cannot translate sheep as mutton or sheep as mouton. Yeah, sheep as mouton, sorry. No? Okay. The two don't, so translation on this structuralist view becomes impossible. <coughs> and Saussure says as much. This is in his Cours de Linguistique Générale. He says, if words stood for pre-existing concepts, if there were a number of concepts in all human brains, then we would have the same words for them, and it would simply be flipping from one word to the other. But it isn't, and he gives them sheep example, and he gives here different examples about renting a house, or German has two words for them, okay? And we have to admit that this is true. Therefore, translation is impossible. Right? However, just prior to this passage in Saussure, he says, oh look, the equivalent of French I is ouch. And here he's trying to talk about the arbitrary nature of the linguistic sign, and he uses equivalents. He says in one page there are no exact equivalents, and the next page he says there are. So what was happening in structuralism, in this view of languages dividing up the world? Is translation possible or not possible? Or perhaps sometimes possible? When you get hurt, when you go, ouch, or impossible if you're trying to rent a house, according to this example. Thought on this developed a paradigm, an approach to translation, which is called equivalence. And I'll just try to explain in really simple terms the idea of equivalence, okay? We mentioned it before, perhaps. Now, in an ideal world, if all languages and concepts were the same, when this person sends that message to those people, it equals the same thing over there. Okay? That would be the ideal world. But these people over here speak a different language. Therefore, structuralism <coughs> suggests they're not equal. It can't be equal. Ah, but then clever translation theorists, really starting from about the 1950s, the people, Vinay Dabonet, the kind of people I mentioned uh, last, or two weeks ago, before Easter, I uh, said, well, what we could do, you see, is change the text. Here I've just changed the, the size of the text. And if we change that, we accommodate for the difference there. And so you get this kind of thinking, like if it's 2 plus 3 plus 4 on this side, it would be 2 plus oh, something over there. Oh, the text has to be four in order for equivalence to exist. So the paradigm of equivalence said, you know what? People translate. We're not worried by the structural division of languages differently because we change what's in the text. In other, I hope you've realized by now that's how we do it. We cheat. You like that? We change the text. And those ch changes in the text are called shifts. Translation shifts. Uh, if it's an active, we put in a passive. Or we add in explicitation to make something clearer. Or we leave out some detail. That, that is, all those solutions that I presented would be called shifts. And they all serve to produce equivalence. The languages themselves don't do it. Translators do it by changing the text. Okay? And that's the equivalence paradigm. That's how a lot of translation theory was developed. Here's an alternative model. This is from Eugene Nida, who was a theorist of Bible translation, evangelical Bible translation. 
And he said, well, you know, here's the channel of contact between sender and receiver. And the channel is only so wide because we have shared reference. We have a shared language, shared culture, shared past. And that's how wide the, the, the channel is so that this text can pass through from one side to the other. And you'll see it fits. Okay? But, says Nida, in translation, by definition, there are fewer shared reference, the channel is narrower, and the text won't fit through. So to get that content through there, you have to make it longer. So you change the size of the text. You make it flatter. And it goes through. A narrower channel. Saying the same thing as the little diagram I used previously, how do you translate? You change the text. No secret. Okay. Uh, all this was within equivalence. Those <coughs> solutions that I presented last week, two weeks ago, are all ways of ob obtaining equivalence. They are all kinds of shifts. They are all the things that translators do. Except for that last one, because in the equivalence paradigm, the two communication acts have to be the same. So if you're actually leaving stuff out or putting stuff in that's not there in the text, you're changing the communication act. So for, for the Vinay Dabulny, the French theorist I was talking about, it stopped there. And those were all shifts. That would be the equivalence paradigm. Any questions about that? Equivalence doesn't ever, it, the, the paradigm as it developed, never said that there is word for word correspondence. Okay, that was the usage way back in early Russian theory. They did have that. But the equivalence paradigm as a mode of thought really was you change the text in order to establish communicative functional equivalence. That was the paradigm. You all happy with that? Good, you're with me? All right. All that paradigm, that's about you know, 30 years of theory you just got there. You're doing very well. 1984, uh, two books came out in the same year, uh, but the main mover behind this new way of thinking was this guy, Hans Demel, who co-wrote a book in 1984. Uh, the first one is Foundations for a General Translation Theory, and the second one is uh, translatory Action, Theory and Methods uh, by Juster Holzmentery. And both these books proposed a new way of thinking. They challenged the equivalence paradigm. How did they do it? Well, let's put it this way. I can show you all these different solutions you can use, right? You can have, do all these things to, to obtain equivalence. But I'm not telling you how to choose between them. How do you know which one to use? They don't tell you. Say, oh, you can do that, or that, or that, or that. If you look around for the reason, Femer started very early on saying, well, it, you know what? It depends. It depends not on the text you're translating, not really, well, it does partly on the audience, but in general, it depends on the purpose, on why you are doing this translation. There is this new factor here called the purpose, or what he called skopos, using a Greek word, which means purpose. Okay, he's writing in German. He uses the Greek word skopos in German. And translated into English, this theory uses the word skopos. But skopos is purpose as far as I can see. So take my silly little diagram. You've got a new thing here, which says to get the equivalence relation, or any relation, you've got to take account of the two purposes that are involved. And the second purpose over here, what the translator does, need not be the same as what the author did over here. According to this theory, the translation normally has a different purpose from the non-translation or the start text. Okay? If you think about it, it's often quite true. Uh, if we're just giving information on this university for the press, the one text could be just information for the Australian press. 
But if we're going to convert that in order to attract international students to this university, we'll take that information and rewrite it in a different way to achieve a different purpose. Not just giving information, it becomes a publicity text or part of a publicity campaign. And according to this theory, most, most translational acts have different purposes. Now, they recognize that it's possible to have the same purpose, that is, the same function. Okay? Equivalence is still possible. People can aim for it. But beyond that, there's a new function, and we have to take account, thereby, of other things, such as the client and the receiver. We want to know who is the client, what instructions are you getting from the client about what effect you have to have on that new receiver. And according to this theory, if, you don't, if you're not told that, you don't know how to translate it. So every time I give you a translation to do, and I've been doing that, right, and you go and you translate quite happily, according to this theory, you shouldn't do that. You should say, why? No, you don't say that. Please tell me the purpose of the translation. Please tell me who is the readership? Who is this for? What effect does it have to have? What level of quality do you require? In short, what instructions can I get about how to do this text? Okay. If you go, if, if somebody wants a swimming pool put in their house, happens in Melbourne, and they get somebody to come out, the guy they say, put a swimming pool there. The guy doesn't come out and just put a swimming pool. You get this whole, you know, how big do you want it? How expensive do you want it? What shape do you want? What's your deadline? You've got to get all these instructions or specifications about the job. Translation is like that. Translations are expensive products and they can be delivered in different ways. This paradigm, this approach, this set of theories, in fact, turns equivalence into a special case. For the previous paradigm, equivalence defined what a translation was what this one aim was. Here, equivalence exists, but it's reduced to a special case. You can do it if you want, but there are all these other things that you can do. The dominant factor, this is a citation from Reis and Ferrier, 1984, the dominant factor in a translation is its purpose, scopus, zweck, as well, they use the term meaning aim in German. Thereby, the source text is dethroned, this is a word used on the back cover of one of Femme's books. I have dethroned the king. The, the source text is no longer the king. The purpose is the king. Okay? A revolution, if you like. And it follows that the same text, the same start text, could be translated in different ways for different purposes. Okay, I gave the example of information text that it is converted into publicity but it becomes a general principle um, of this approach. And all strategies are legitimate if they achieve the purpose. So what counts is not, you can't come along and say, oh, it's not a good translation because I know what a translation is and that doesn't look like a good translation. No, everything's valid as long as the purpose is achieved. There are a group of theorists here, and they don't all agree on all points. For Fermer, uh, the person who decides what the purpose is and how to achieve it is ultimately the translator, not the client. For uh, Justa Holzmentery, she has a theory of the translator as an expert in intercultural communication who works with people who are experts in the field the client usually, or client's representative, and there is collaborative expertise. <clears throat> we give what we know about communication, they give what they know about, about the purpose of, of the communication from their perspective. So it's a little different. Christiana Nort, who's in the same group of theorists, uh, would tend to privilege the client. The, the translator should get the client's instructions and follow the client. Okay, so there's not, not all agreement on this particular point. 
This is from Christiana Nort, uh, and she's just saying where translation is in the world. Okay, just follow the, the diagram. You've got communication. It can be intercultural or cross-cultural, intra or inter, if you like, if you prefer. We're looking at cross-cultural communication. It can be direct or mediated. If it's direct, people code switch, change languages. If it's mediated, you've got somebody helping you do it, a translator, interpreter, or mediator of some kind. That mediated cross-cultural communication is called translatorial action. That was the title in one of the books I just showed you. Translatorial refers to the translator. Okay. That could be of two kinds. Translational, when there is a source text that they're working on, or non-translational, when there's not. The translator can help you draft a new text. The client can come along and say, I want this text to attract Chinese students to the University of Melbourne, and you can look at that, and you know how it works, and you say, look, it's a load of rubbish, they're not going to believe this stuff, it's not what interests them, get rid of that text, let's sit down and write a new text. And you are working then a non-translational, tran mediated cross-cultural communication. Okay? But translators could also help with the terminology, and they can give consulting advice on how to achieve your aim in communicating across cultures. This side is the traditional place of translations. Translations can have a new function when you use quite radical shifts or the same function you're back to the old paradigm of equivalence. So they're not getting rid of equivalence, they're just saying look there it is but there's all these other things that we can do that translators can do or students, like you, can be trained to do. And often those other things are more interesting and potentially more lucrative than straight equivalence-based translation. Any questions? Are you convinced that this is a superior way of looking at translation? Who cares? You are? Yes. I summarize it. Equivalence went out of fashion. It went out of fashion in the mid-1980s because it didn't consider different purposes. It assumed there was just one. Uh, scopos, or purpose, seems to solve this problem because it refers to uh, things happening afresh on the target side. It refers to the client and what they want. It refers to the new receivers and what is suitable for them. Uh, for equivalence theory, the way you translate depends on the text, basically. Okay? For Skopos theory, it depends on the function to be achieved, which is target side function. That's it. That's the whole theory. You got that in a couple of minutes. That's better than reading a whole chapter of my book. All right?